Welcome to the Learning with Lowell podcast. I am Lowell Thompson, and my lifelong love of learning saved my life. A few years ago, I was in and out of the ER and ICU with no end in sight due to, at the time, a mysterious illness. I read medical journals, talked to scientists and researchers, and learned how to develop a good treatment plan, all of which put me on the path to becoming healthy, which I am now. I have met the team responsible for creating the drug that saved my life. And now I'm taking my experiences and love of learning and translating them into interviews with experts, CEOs, and scientists in order to achieve three goals in every episode. To have fun and interesting conversations that are enjoyable to listen to, to learn what these people are developing and creating, to hear what their tactics, strategies, tools, books, and resources they use to accomplish what they were doing, so that you can learn, apply, and see what else is out there and enrich your life with every episode. Additionally, there will be an email capture in the show notes specifically for people who want to help and learn more about this Kickstarter I'm running next month. It is related to bees, so if you've ever asked yourself, how am I helping out the bees, considering they lost 40% in the U.S. alone last winter, then sign up for the newsletter and you'll get weekly updates about the developing problems in beekeeping and bees specifically and bee researchers as well. So I'll leave that there. Check it out. Uh, it's going to be amazing. You guys are, for longtime listeners and fans who have been messaging me on ways you can be supportive, this is a big way. So even if you just send that email capture to your, your Twitter, being like, hey, this guy's working on something, that'd be really helpful. If you want to sign up yourself, that's amazing as well. Remember, show notes, check it out, and it'll be labeled as well. I'm joined with Dr. Rai Menjes. She is the president and director of Aerospace Research Systems. She's been in aerospace for over 20 years. Really, truly a passionate person. We get into so many different topics in this interview, so I decided to split it into two, like I've been doing. It seems like you guys really like the smaller increments so that you can um, you know, listen to one and then not have to like guess where you pick up after if you move platforms or something like that i don't know whatever it is you guys seem to be liking uh the two parters are like breaking them up so i'm going to keep doing that since it seems to be what you guys enjoy if you don't like that you know send me an email let me know because i'm always just trying to respond to what i see (laughs) i see you guys enjoying so today we're gonna learn about rye menjes uh what she does for fun with her aerospace and and that science background uh she does a lot and it's really exciting to see how every bit of her life is touched by the stem experiences and knowledge that she has so without further ado we're going to get into what she is building and what she's working on and if you want to check her out check out arisspace.com a-r-s-i-s-p-a-c-e.com and learn more about what they're doing she's also based out in ohio which is kind of interesting you you know an aerospace company out in ohio you don't hear much about that but 25 years you're going to learn about a lot of stuff so let's get into it and this is part one so i was reading about you on linkedin and I was trying to read as much as I can on your your, your website, aerospace.com. And so it's like, just looking at the LinkedIn stuff, like it's like you have a, a number of patents. You have a PhD, which I think is pretty cool. I, I like that people spend many, many years to be the best or like an expert at a, a very specific thing. You know, almost like two decades in aerospace. And you, you founded an aerospace research company. Mm-hmm. So I'm curious, like, what are some of the things that you, like, that's very like, science and business type things i'm curious like what are the things that you get really excited to talk about but that you normally don't in a daily your daily life like is there something that you're really nerdy about that is um not related to those things or maybe are you just like all encompassing research and development aerospace even at home well no no, there are a lot of things i get very excited about i'm i'm uh i actually have a large property so I have like a certified wildlife habitat and we do a lot of work to try to look at um, urban wildlife and, and there are a number of properties around me that have anywhere from two to 20 acres in the inner city. So we're able to look at things like that. And I invented something called spin systems, which is a self-powered uh, intelligent network. And we use our renewable energy products to power it. So it's totally independent and we can set up, um, ledgers at each site to gather data and do data comparison and actually it's kind of an experiment that we're not only because we're a bunch of weirdos and we're accountants and lawyers and engineers and scientists uh, looking at what it, you know what's happening to um, wildlife in the inner cities and even in residential areas because it's there are a lot of changes happening that we're I'm really surprised about and um, 
it's it's kind of weird because we're using the same kind of networks that are we're planning to put um, five up this fall to do satellite telemetry and research on renewable energy and technologies around the United States and Colorado, New Mexico, Ohio, New York, Texas, and Kentucky. So, um, and half of them are space oriented mm -hmm. because people are launching their own satellites and they need a way to work that's reliable and effective and they can control their own data. So basically these networks allow you to create your own data center. It's just a ledger based system. And so we're re really excited that we're actually demonstrating this, uh, at least on a volunteer basis, um, looking at the environment around urban areas in the United States. Hmm. Um, because we, 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 you know, we see a, a big change in the health in, of the urban areas. And that's a huge thing for people who live in them. I think people forget they're part of the ecosystem. So that's something that gets me excited. Yeah, no, um, I'm, I'm big into bees and I've been re reading a lot recently that, that they do really, really well, surprisingly in urban centers. And like uh, in Chicago, there are, I think there's like 800 coyotes that live in the city, like 400 foxes, like they like are cataloging these things. Um, so I, I feel like in terms of like environment, I mean, may, maybe not, you're thinking probably more macro scale than just down to the animal level, but there's like a lot of untapped research. Like I think even in Sydney, Australia, there was a, a paper that came out where like the spiders, the spiders mm -hmm. were getting really big in, in urban areas, like, <laughs> like 30% bigger. And, you know, I don't think like of all the places, I don't want anything in Australia to get bigger. Like there's their animals are scary. Like the funnel spiders could actually get bigger. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They apparently they look like, so I know around where I'm at, I'm not in a, in a city I'm in Austin, but like, I was like, I don't know, I'm not in Austin, but the spiders will just make a nest around the, the, uh, the light and just call it a day. Like it's just a little open buffet. <laughs> they don't even have to work for it. So, um, they, yeah, they're getting bigger and stuff. So like, but how, how long will it take before you start seeing data come back and like, learn well, we have, we have data now and we're finding that, you know, we can actually improve the situation for a lot of, um, the things that are really in trouble, like, like turtles and salamanders and toads and frogs that have been disappearing. And um, I was born in northern Michigan on Lake Michigan, so I grew up with just, you know, wildlife around me. And it, it, as, a, as a kid, you know, I was um, outdoors all the time. And it was, you know, pretty common for me to bring something in the house and then get it ex escorted back out of the house with it. So um, every place I've lived, I've, I've become really interested in, in um, the environment and the interaction with humans and the environment and what, what that means for us. I know that in a lot of inner cities, we're having a lot of problems with heat waves this summer. And a lot of it has to do with the thermal mass we've created in the inner cities. And there are new types of concrete that actually don't hold the heat, um, like the old forms of concrete. And cities are starting to move to those so you can cool your city. So there are things you, you can actually do in the built environment. Um, my one company, um, the Star Sailor Group, which is comprised of Star Sailor Wind and Star Sailor Power, we have a renewable energy, um, which we call a veggie wall. And our veggie wall is neat because it's modular. You can put it in your backyard, grow food for your family. If you ever move, you can take it with you because it's four by eight and you can pack it up on the back of a pickup truck and take it with you. And one of the things we found out um, building it because it uh, uses something called aeroponics, which is better than hydroponics. Uh, in certain areas where people are still using hydroponics and the humidity and the heat we're having this year, they're having issues with fungal in, uh, infestations and things where their plants are actually being destroyed. And this is a growing problem where you have a lot more heat and a lot more humidity than you've ever had before. So it's actually um, looking at ways to deal with changes in the environment because we are getting a lot of heat, whether you think it's global warming or a new glacial era or just general, you know, normal fluctuations in the climate, we have some real issues in front of us. And how do we deal with those in, in our homes and in our environments? And, you know, we can live sustainably, we just have to figure out how to do it. And uh, one of the things we're looking at is how do we reduce the cost of food? Mm -hmm. And because, you know, everybody wants organic food, everybody wants it now. And, and I'm a big organic person. And, um, one of the things we're looking at is how do we get local food? 
So we're looking at those technologies uh, to keep local food growing year round for people. And that's the same, that's our, our little um, growing unit that will do that. So a lot of this is, you know, we're experimenting with a lot of things that um, started a long time ago on um, a sustainability project out West. And that's where we, I actually designed our first wind turbine. And this is, you know, back in 93, 94, when people were skiing topless at Taos and uh, Taos and so nobody really would notice a, a pickup truck driving down I-25 with wind turbines on the top of it when we were testing them. Um, you know, it got honked at a little bit, but it was a pretty different time in New Mexico. Mm-hmm. And um, we found out that we were getting higher power out of our little turbines and we couldn't figure out why. And eventually we figured out that we were protecting the advancing blade, which removed something like 80% of the drag at equilibrium. That's where you have equal energy in and out um, of the wind turbine. And that was a big deal. Mm -hmm. So starting about 10 years ago, we started looking at ways of designing new vertical access wind turbines that would actually work. Mm -hmm. And now we're actually manufacturing them. They're biomimetic. So the rotors are designed to act like the wings of birds. And it creates an efficiency in the vertical axis uh, system that you haven't seen before. And the other effect of that is they're the most reliable wind turbines. Um, They don't have brakes. They don't have um, all kinds of fairing or pitch control or anything that you have on propeller systems. So you have a much lower rate of failure. Mm -hmm. And the only failure we've ever had wasn't a rotor failure. It was a bearing failure. And, so there's no way for our units to come apart because the, the horizontal, the propeller turbines actually disintegrate under the wrong conditions. And so this is a, this is a big deal for us because this is one of the central components to our um, spin systems, our self-powered and intelligent networks. And um, they don't make noise. They don't kill birds. They don't kill pollinators. And it took a while to do this, but um, we, we created a, a really interesting product. Um, now, how does that deal with space? Um, well, you need to be able to communicate and create terrestrial networks so you can utilize space data. Mm-hmm. And, and right now, one of the greatest challenges for commercial space, real commercial space, not government commercial space, but independent private commercial space, is how we communicate. And right now, we have very limited communications. There are only a few really accessible commercial teleports in the United States. Um, some of the ones that have been built by like Moorhead State University, people have never heard of them. They're in the eastern hills of Kentucky, but Dr. Ben Melfris built a space sciences center at the university and they have a 21 meter dish and they worked with everybody, including Planet Labs. So you actually have new space companies evolving and being founded now that are actually going and building dishes. Mm-hmm. And some of them are building really big dishes. And they're doing it because there just isn't enough bandwidth for all the communications that everybody wants to do. Um, one of the bigger privately owned um, spaceport companies, they have East, Eastern U- United States and Western United States as U.S. Electrodynamics. And that's Jim Veter's company, and they do wonderful work. Um, so this is, this is a really big area. This is probably one of the fastest um, pressure points fastest growing pressure points for commercial space. And it's one of those things that concerns me and my, my group of um, uh, colleagues that are working on our, our vehicle work because we have a space plane that we officially announced last year. We have a high level group and we're in in the process of doing some of the initial work on it uh, beyond the decade or so of actual research and design and experimentation. So we're actually putting the work together to build it. And so one of our our big questions is, okay, we know how to operate. We have operating models. We know how we're going to have funding. We're going to have basically what in business we call low hanging fruit. Mm -hmm. So we're we're going to a fast launch, um, small payload stage in about two years. So we'll be able to launch very quickly and turn around very quickly. So we're not initially, we were focusing on a human rated vehicle. Mm -hmm. And we did work on that for about 12 years. And most of the work is actually done. We have payload, habitat, 
flight deck, all that's designed, but that's all really, really expensive. Mm-hmm. Um, so we're going to an autonomous vehicle that will allow us to launch uh, payloads very, very quickly with a really short turnaround time and do suborbital flight as well as um, low Earth orbit. And that, that's our, our goal right now. And it looks like we're pretty close uh, on target in terms of time-wise for about one and a half to two years for our first launch. Hmm. The, there's like, I, I think there's two things I want to say. The, um, there's this great Einstein quote that makes, that kind of makes me think of you, which is, um, he's, and this is paraphrasing of course, but the, he, he said that if I had an hour to live to solve a question, like, you know, one hour to solve this question and my life depended on it, I would spend 55 minutes defining the problem and then five minutes solving it. And it seems like you yeah. ever, whenever mm-hmm. Oh, you, you know that quote? Uh, yeah, I know. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> okay. okay. <laughs> it just seems like listening to you, it sounds like you, you do that where it's like, it's not like shallow questions. Like you really dive deep into a subject and really spend a lot of time asking questions before you start implementing a solution to it. And I'm one. That's, and- the, only, that's the only way you're ever successful. Hmm. Well, then the, the, the second part to that, to, to this is like, I was listening to the Joe Rogan interview with Elon Musk and he, he, he talked about how like he doesn't think anyone should want to be him because it's like his brain never shuts off. And so, but at the same time, like when I'm listening to you, like it seems like you have a, a balanced way of digging deeply, but not like having like the, the Nietzsche problem of like having the darkness <laughs> stare back at you. And so I'm wondering, how do you, <laughs> like if you were to like walk through a, um, a, 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 a problem you were trying to solve, like, and then like, like show how you break down the problem. Like, I'm just curious, like how do you actually break down problems and like that 55, five minute kind of like feel to it? Cause it's, you know, I think the listeners, it's a very weird thing, like to spend so much time on it. Um, and yet like it is very beneficial to do that. And it's actually a lot of fun too, but like, I'm curious well, like, how you do it. Well, actually, first of all, you want to make sure you've identified the right problem. Hmm. Cause a lot of people chase the wrong problems. Um, so once you're sure you have a valid problem and it's the real problem you need to solve. Um, I was trained as a mathematician initially. And so you, you've approached to looking at problems and categorizing the type of problem you have um, in, order, or in order to solve it. Some problems are theoretical. Some problems are numerical. Some problems are physical. And um, so you, you, you base your solution. See, you're going to get a nerdy answer. Sorry about that. Oh, no, I love teach. it. I love it. Please go, <laughs> go more nerdy. I love this. But you know, it's the definitions, um, that, that you, you need in order to, um, solve the problem. So, you know, if you have, if you have a numerical problem, obviously you want to look at, um, uh, you know, how to solve something numerically and, and the type of numerical uh, solution you're going to look for. So it's actually a whole field of study called numerical analysis. So you, depending on the, on the type of problem you, you focus on, whether it's applied or theoretical or if it's just there to entertain you. Um, see, a lot, of, a lot of the things that we have today in social media and the news are problems that are de- designed just to entertain Mm-hmm. They're not really there for people to solve. It's just there to entertain. So the other issue is, okay, if you have a problem, um, what is it, what's it caused by? Do you have to fix the cause before you can fix the problem? Um, so, you know, the simple thing, you lock yourself out of the house, your keys are on the counter. How do you get in? Um, that's a physical problem. So generally most people have no way to break into their house. Um, and somebody who doesn't know how to break into their house, I'm really worried about them. They don't know their house very well. <laughs> but, um, you know, so that it depends on the type of problem. And really, there are methods of breaking down, like if we're looking at a vehicle system and we know there's a, an, an issue with a subsystem and we don't know what it is, then we actually use a, a field of systems engineering that allows us to take the vehicle apart uh, within a computer or on a piece of paper in a room with a bunch of engineers and we, we reverse engineer um, the systems matrix for the, for the vehicle. And so that way you look at the power systems, the computing systems, the control systems, the materials, the structures, you know, what components do you have? Um, what's drawing power? Is there something that you're, you have an issue with because of a control system not functioning? Does that mean 
one of your devices that uses power, it's, it, it's not working properly. It's, you know, the frequency's wrong. There's, there's a surge. A lot of times with battery stacks, um, sometimes the battery stacks you get, you have an analytical tool to uh, investigate the stack to see if it's a, a, something that can be shunted off or if you've got to send it back to be rebuilt because every battery stack has a bunch of cells in it and each cell has their own little chip and it's, that can be a nightmarish experience by the way. And mm -hmm. um, for, if you're a systems engineer and people just yawned, I know, but it's, it's a fact of life. Um, so yeah, I mean, there are, there are methods of that are very sophisticated to look at problems. And then there are methods that generally you, you, um, deduce a, 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 um, you know, you use deduction to basically, determine the cause of the problem to solve it mm -hmm. you know like like sherlock holmes yeah actually uh, i was thinking of sherlock holmes like i was like because this uh it reminds me of uh i i'm like i've been slowly reading through all of them and there's every now and again there's a case where like it's like he he notices that the dog didn't bark well he notices variables that like don't don't exist or like most people wouldn't account for because like they're not like it's not like person A did you know A B and C, and then it's like things that didn't happen, and so it's weird to like think in a way that like you think of these like weird things that don't happen in that way. It kind of I think it's called like black swan. Like that's probably like a modern way if people read that. Um, like mm -hmm. these things that like you know all swans are white, but then it's like how do you know if there isn't a black swan somewhere? Like what are they like these like extenuating circumstances? But um. Or situation well I, I think what's interesting is, is that when I'm, I'm putting my book together something I realized is that scientists and engineers and mathematicians think differently than people in other fields we use deductive reasoning whereas a lot of people in the creative area use inductive reasoning so you know inductive reasoning it, you, you, the premises you, you basically they're supplying some evidence for the truth of the conclusion you're, you're creating something Whereas deductive reasoning, um, you use logic and certain processes that actually uh, kind of reduce the question that you're trying to answer. Mm -hmm. So that, to me, that's a real dichotomy in trying to train people um, in how to function well in commercial, the commercial space field if they're not an engineer or a scientist. Um, and that's something that we're looking at because people, a lot of people now in the management of commercial space entities are not scientists or engineers they're lawyers and accountants and accountants tend to be able to do more deductive reasoning than not but they're also mbas and the mba schools really need to improve um analytical school uh, skills i mean there's a there's an area in game theory um it's an area of mathematics called combinatorics and combinatorics is used a lot in um uh, and that analytical and, and simulation work, but it's also used in uh, logic systems where you're writing software. And there's a field, uh, a subfield of that when you're learning the, the, the math, it's called finite mathematics. And you actually can, I'm using these terms so people who are listening can actually go steal a book from the library. You know, actually check it out, don't steal it. <laughs> but, <laughs> um, and actually learn that you can develop a, something called a truth table, and that truth table will actually help you determine the structures of statements um, when you're looking at new concepts and you can you can break down any new concept in, into a statement and that break that statement down into several different symbolic sentences that'll allow you to evaluate that concept so it's it, you can actually do this um, pictorially you don't even have to do mathematics you just have you can you know like draw uh, diagrams and tables using um, symbols for your elements and actually come up with some pretty sophisticated stuff. Um, when I started teaching systems engineering and I did some STEM outreach and I wanted to teach um, how to do a relationship of a systems matrix, and I think some, most people remember rock, paper, scissors, lizard, Spock from yeah. like Big Bang Theory. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, you, you know, um, paper covers rock, you know, lizard, lizard, poison, Spock, that kind of thing. So you actually develop a matrix where it shows the relationships between the different elements of that um, group, that, that set of elements, rock, paper, scissors, lizard, Spock, that's our set of elements. And you can actually create a matrix from that and see how the, those various elements interrelate in, in their operations. Hmm. I, yeah. think 
I think that's one of the, <laughs> like the, the amazing benefits of like spending time to learn a, a STEM field because it, it helps you better appreciate the world. Like you learn mathematics and you're able to apply it in all these different areas. And, and that's more or less how innovation happens. Like you apply two different things in a weird way. Like it doesn't, you don't have to like create things from like the ether. But like, I think that's one of the things that I hope, I don't know, a lot of my listeners have been appreciating as well. It's like most people think like you learn math for math's sake. And I had a high school teacher when I, I'd ask them, I went to college too. So like, I'll stop giving you examples from high school, but like they, they, um, they, I was like, why, would, why do we need to learn this? And he was like, well, if you want to be an engineer, you'll definitely use it a lot. But like for most of the time, it's, uh, it's usually just for, good for your brain. And I just like math. I think it's fun. Um, but like I, I have noticed like the more you do these things, like the mathematics and just learn more about STEM things, you're able to like, like what you're saying, like really go deep in on problems and think about it in a way that is different. So I guess like I'm just, I guess corroborating your point to the extent that like I've seen what you're saying, but I've never thought it in the way that you said it. And now I'm like, it's like, once you see it, it's like really hard not to see it. So it's really interesting. Like what, what you just said, is there other than like, maybe like just doing the deep dive on, uh, on, um, game theory, are there other ways that you'd suggest people to learn more, like to experiment or to like make, like practice, uh, deductive reasoning so they can be better at it? Um, there are actual games. Uh, that are out there and you can, you can find them. I was actually going to look up um, selective reasoning games, um, but you can, you can find stuff. Um, yeah. There's happy neuron. There's a bunch of um, um, game sites out there that you mm. can actually, you know, cause it, this is the basis of, you know, all the games people play now that are, you know, um, pretty, you know, common i i mean i think most most of the geeks out there are under the age of even i think 60 now have a gaming rig somewhere in their house so yeah. i googled about but, apparently uh mm-hmm. there's a yeah there's like huge lists of them uh stratego yeah there are there's you know there's deductive reasoning puzzles there's all kinds of stuff. sudoku is kind of like that hmm Sudoku has always been weird to me. I know some, I know I can figure it out if I spend time to figure it out, but I've never spent time to figure it out, which seems to be the problem. But um, well, my, my, my issue with that is it's, I don't have enough time in the day to do something like that. And yeah. if I want to, if I want to do something, you know, I'll play chess with a friend or something. Do, uh, in terms of just like uh, games that are fun yet, like kind of stimulate your mind. Are you like a, a chess person or do you like go or show gear? Anything like that? I'm I'm more I'm more of a chess person. Um, I tried a couple times playing computer chess. I like suicide chess on Apple, and I know the chess people out there are going, "Oh, that's so disappointing." But <laughs> but it's it's a quick game, and you can think. And um, you know, I I even tried a couple of the new battleship games because I like strategy games, and I really haven't found anything that's, that's real. Um, challenging i can I, I found a couple where you can turn your mind off and play but um it's just not the same thing so i'm you know i'm looking for that that you know kind of uber kind of uh, battleship game that'll give me everything i want <laughs> that's my goal <laughs> my my girlfriend for whatever reason always wins at she says she like like she has like there's like patterns that she can see. It's like the one thing that she's like it's just like really good at reading people on. But she she'll mm-hmm. beat anyone at Battleship. So she always knows where you put it. And like and like even if you try and change it, she sees it, which makes sense. Like you're changing it to like try and like anticipate her behavior. But then she like within like three moves, she knows where you're at. And it's like well, because she knows your behavior already. Okay. So you, yeah, so it's not going to work. You got to find someone else to play because oh, she'll do it to that, anyone. That, that, oh really? Yeah, I've oh, seen her sit down. Like she'll, she will, if we're out at a new place, I'll, I'll bring, I'm kind of, I'm kind of a nerdy person. So if I go to a party, I'll bring a game with me and you know, like people <laughs> make fun of me, but then they sit down and play the game and I get to talk to them and I don't have to work that hard. So, but anyways, she always wants me to bring battleship because she like, we'll, we'll go to, um, I went, like she went to one of my friends' parties and she brought it with and mm-hmm. she beat everyone there and they like, they tried beating her. And it, well, like, here, here's a thought. You got to teach your girlfriend to play poker. Cause she could be like a, stellar poker player if I'll she can read that. people that well she should learn she can make money 
I don't know if she understands the probabilities, but she she doesn't hate math. She wouldn't but, yeah. have to. You don't, you know, poker, it's about reading people. If you know the game, you know, it's all about the psychology. Hmm. I don't know, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll suggest it to her tonight, but it's like, it's, an, it's inhuman how good she is. It's like, I don't know. I, if there was a way to like profit from that, I wish there was, but um, maybe poker is the way, but um, I'm curious, like the, in a couple of examples of what you're working on, like with uh, the turbines realizing that like they needed to be a certain way. I'm sorry. I'm like paraphrasing because mm-hmm. I'm trying to like think of how to ask this question, but the, I'll, it reminded me of the, I think it's Arthur C. Clarke that said like the most interesting thing in science isn't, isn't Eureka or like the thing that is interesting. The thing that usually has interesting things come from it isn't Eureka, but that's interesting. So like at these, at many different parts of your, what you're, what you describe and like, it seems like you'll be like, Oh, that's interesting. And you guys dig into it and then you figure out why that is. But mm-hmm. there is a, um, there is a good uh, Carl Sagan quote. I wrote it down because I thought maybe it would come in handy. I always try to find quotes around like what people might uh, talk about so that, that people that, you know, listen in could, you know, uh, phrase around it. But the basic thing is that um, Carl Sagan said that it is far better to grasp the universe as it really is than persist in a delusion, however satisfying or comfortable. And so like, and it, we kind of touch on this in this idea of like digging deep on questions, but like, and like finding ways to, um, think about like black swan events but I'm, I'm i'm really curious about this idea like what are there are there other good examples of of you looking at a situation saying like that's funny and then like digging into it and then that's something you're working on now if if, if that's if that's everything then it um makes it easier no but. it's not because we do so much materials work i mean our, our two areas are um uh, autonomous intelligence systems and materials and then with our company that's really our areas of expertise and um one of the things I was working on some years ago is how we could do uh, create a, a coating for ceramics that would give us um, the ability to either create a frequency variable surface or some type of um, photonically responsive surface because we can do that with thin films. But a lot of times the thin film materials like the polyamides we use aren't as robust as we would like them to be, and they certainly aren't good in hot environments. So um, one of the things we're looking at is how we could dope ceramics to create, basically, you're inducing a type of sensor um, as part of, so that's a materials device. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that um, we found out is that we could actually change conductivity, and that really surprised us. So we changed the insulating character of certain ceramics by using pretty simple coatings. And those coatings have led us on to other areas of work. But um, uh, yeah, so it's, it's that kind of stuff. Usually you have those little things that happen that you don't expect um, that, that have become really useful for us. One of the things that kind of creeps me out, and this is a while back when I was doing, Uh, really active research in what we call the artificial neural membrane. Um, That's an intelligent structure, actually. So it's it's layered substrates that are programmed using um, uh, neurogenesis networks. And one of the things we found out is we made two of these identical at the same time, and we were kind of curious how the sensor networks would work. And we ended up noticing that the one network, if it was powered at the same time the other network was powered, it would actually give a much lower level signal, but still a signal from the same sensor area of of its twin structure. And that kind of creeped us out because it's like, you know, spooky action at a distance, even though it wasn't a big distance. And some years ago, um, they did research with something called squids and squids are, are um, at the, in the, in, at the time they were defined as superconducting quantum interferometric devices. And they found out that they could put these squid nets on people's heads and they could put someone connected to another person in a dark room with no sensory input and have the other person in a, in a room watching a movie and the person watching the movie um, would actually 
uh, send information to the person not watching the movie. So they have actually get glimpses of the movie in their minds from the person watching the movie. That was really creepy too. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we realized that maybe we could do some things differently with our technology. And so the idea, or, and this came about about, um, I don't know, 14, 15 years ago, that when you have a spacecraft uh, in flight, you have something called a proof mass, and a like P R O O F, uh, and that proof mass allows the um, spacecraft to basically um, measure the space around it. So it helps it with its navigation, particularly if you're using gravitational, um, you know. Grab it, the, 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 what we call spheres of influence around the different planets and you use gravitational acceleration to get your, your vehicle where you want it to go. And so we thought, you know, maybe we could simulate a proof mass using this technology and be able to program space within the vehicle. And in all the years I taught, and I, I, I tried to get my students to do a starship. I said, look, I know it's a tough thing to do. I'm going to look at it as a tough thing to do. It's not going to affect your grade, but how would you build a starship? And I couldn't get any of my classes to do a starship. And um, one of the things that we need to know about starships is how we can um, basically navigate interstellar space at some uh, component of light speed. You know, if we're at 0.5 C, which is half a light speed, you need to be really good at navigating. Mm -hmm. So, you know, this is one of those theoretical things that we played with is how do we create a proof mass that we can create that is adaptive and pro will program uh, for something like a starship. So y y you get into really kind of theoretical excursions when you have a lot of smart people around. It's probably not a good thing, but it's interesting to, th to think that we could actually program um, space within a computer. In other words, we could, you know, I, when I was lecturing one time and I said, you know, theoretically, hundred years from now, when we have probes, say in the Vega system or some other system in our, our uh, galaxy, and we want to be able to visit that, theoretically, we could actually program one of these kinds of computers and, act, and, and be able to interface with it and, and for all intents and purposes, be at Vega without going to Vega. Mm -hmm. And so I had students who are like, wow, you just blew my mind. And I said, and yeah, you wouldn't build a starship, you know, because we're trying to do a virtual vehicle. And so I've had messages from students um, since they've graduated that, you know, like I wish we tried to build a starship because there's a lot of stuff you have to think about that you don't think about, um, you know, and, and I, I hate saying sticks and stones era of space because everybody thinks we're advancing so rapidly, but, you know, we're still using chemicals to get to orbit. and um, sometimes not very intelligently, and we we have technologies that that uh, we could focus on that really could get us to places like Alpha Centauri, Centauri in our lifetime, Proxima Centauri. You know, a little over four light years, we could do that. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, the, the the will and the interest for the investment really isn't there, as I don't think people see the value. I think isn't there? I feel like there's someone who's working on making a a little. Uh, it's like it's not like a satellite but it's like really it's it is small but it has a uh, the space sail stuff that you fire beams at and it goes really really fast oh the russian guy yeah yeah um yeah and apparently that'll get there pretty about. quick yeah okay yeah someone's working on this but i feel mm -hmm. like i feel like it's yeah i don't know i feel like people would do it for the sake of doing it but it would be kind of like i mean i think we learned a lot I, I think for the right, right, you know, you have all these, um, what about, what about isms? I think it's like a logical fallacy, but like whenever you try and do something, they're like, well, what, why, what about the roads or what about the people over in Timbuktu or whatever? Like they always make it about something else, but it's like, you can do many things Like we can go into space and like explore other solar systems and we can do, you know, in, building up our infrastructure. Like they're, they're going to impact each other. Um, I mean, like you work on aerospace and yet you're working on, a better understanding of urban environments that's going to benefit a lot of people. Um, well, I, hopefully it, it benefits our ability to, to understand sensor data, collect it, store it, and create these distributed data centers kind of databases. So we don't have to, you know, build these giant data centers anymore that take 
all the energy <laughs> that a small city takes. And um, this way it's distributed and it's, it's more redundant and it's self-powered. So you don't have to worry about, you know, lack of fuel or other failures of the grid. And, and that's the other thing, you know, I just did a presentation for a Silicon Valley group in Chicago and it was on commercializing space. And I said, one of the things that we need to look at is, you know, our sun is our friend, but it also uh, goes through cycles. And sometimes you can have sunspots that are pretty significant. And as a matter of fact, you know, about 17 years ago, I think that's about right. I'm sure I'll get yelled at for that. But there was an X flare and it didn't hit us. It, it, it missed the earth, but um, we could have a CME, a coronal mass ejection that can take out our grid. Mm -hmm. And ph physicists have been warning about this for probably over a decade. And the Institute of Electrical and Electronic Engineers have been warning about it as well. Um, our, our grid is really not in great shape. So the idea of powering independent networks across the United States that would give power, communications, computing, data storage, and collect environmental and weather information is pretty important. Um, so, you know, one of the things we're looking at is um, how do we do, you know, remote power for, for emergencies for certain situations. And um, that's a, it's a big part of it. But if you remember the fires in California that were so severe and killed so many people, that was because of, of the, the grid being poorly maintained and creating, you know, arcing across very dry wood, wooded areas. Mm -hmm. And, and if you, if you travel to other countries, I mean, if you travel to China, um, most of their electrical uh, transport systems, their, their uh, electrical wires are underground. Um, they're, they're not, you don't see wires everywhere. Um, particularly in their big cities. And the United States is, is really behind in the way we provide electrical service and electrical transportation um, to the end users, whether it's, it's corporate or residential, we're, we're not doing the things we need to do. It's one of those big infrastructure problems. Um, but, you know, it's, it's, it's one of the things we look at is, okay, if we have commercial space and it's functioning and it's doing everything it should do, how do we use those capabilities to improve life on earth and, and create um, options for a lot of the things that we're dealing with today. And the big thing is creating really almost personal communications capabilities where you can control your own communications, your own computing and your own data. And that is something I think that makes some government agencies very insecure. That's why you have, you know, commercial space programs with NASA focusing on, on NASA architectures. Um, right now they're, they're doing some major work and saying, okay, what, what's the lifespan of the space, International Space Station and what are we going to do with it commercially? Well, the problem is the International Space Station is like a million pounds. It's in orbit. It costs a lot to maintain. It's a, it's a government kind of platform that has never been designed to be economically useful. It's not going to give us an economic return. Um, one of the questions I got during the presentation in Chicago is, are you going to go to Mars? And I said, there is no commercial model for going to Mars. There are commercial models for going to the moon. There are commercial models for building um, industrial operations in orbit. There are commercial models for capturing asteroids. Um, and there are commercial models for repairing and maintaining satellites and other platforms, but there's no sustainable, no real good commercial model for going to Mars if there's no return on it. Mm -hmm. um, so when I hear these big companies or Musk or Bezos, we're going to, to Mars, and I'm going, well, only because the American people are going to pay for it. You're not going to pay for it. And the only you know, hope for you is you know, profit off of the project and what you'll learn from the project. And that's kind of interesting because it's it, there. You're particularly Bezos. He's a smart guy. And um, one of the things I think is interesting is my dad started his career on the Manhattan Project, and there was one contractor on the Manhattan Project. It was Dupont, and Dupont didn't take one cent in profit for the entire project. And the man who ran the company was Walter Carpenter. 
And he made this decision that DuPont would not take one cent in profit. Everything would be expense oriented and there would be no um, other benefit. But here you have to remember, they were learning an entirely new physics. They had access to new knowledge that no one else on the planet had. They had access to new chemistry, new materials, um, new instrumentation that nobody else had. So for them not taking one cent in profit, what they learned from the Manhattan Project drove DuPont to one of the largest companies uh, internationally, you know, through the 1980s. So it was really kind of a visionary idea on the part of uh, Carpenter uh, to do that. And it was an extraordinary thing. And you think you had a, a program that was 100,000 people. Um, it was, you know, it was just something that I don't think we could repeat today. And that was Rai Menjez. Remember to check her out at aerospace.com. Additionally, she is the president and CEO of SolarSail Inc., Aerospace Research Systems, and the founder of Sometimes It Takes a Rocket Scientist. And these are things that she's been going, going on for decades, so definitely check them out. Check out her LinkedIn. Everything's going to be in the show notes. And, I mean, I mean, you heard this, this person. Fantastic. So passionate. And, I mean... I learned so much just listening to her. I wish we could have gone on for hours, honestly. She's one of, the, uh, one of those types of people, and I think all of you will agree as well, where it's just like you could just sit and listen to her talk about whatever she's going on that day. Cause it's just So check her out, aerospace.com, and look in the show notes for her links. Thanks, everybody, for coming around, and here's my outro stuff. Don't forget to subscribe and leave a review. We can be found on Twitter at Lowell was here, Facebook, and on the website, learningwithlowell.com. Also sign up for the newsletter where you can hear amazing content every Monday, new episodes every Tuesday, and new blog posts around every Thursday. Remember to share and tell your friends. Please and thank you.